Hello, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to this show webinar on the advanced features of Wireless Workbench. Now, before we start, I understand that some of you all had to use the last time. So, anyone using an Android or an uh, iOS kind of device in the settings, there is a little push switch called uh, low bandwidth mode. If you switch to low bandwidth mode, um, that should resolve those uh, problems. All right, let's begin with a small recap of what we did the last time. Um, we had a look at some of the basic features available for frequency coordination, inventory control, and the monitor tab in wireless workbench. Some key features to take away from the last one was Basically, it's a tool from Shaw. It's a free tool downloadable from the website. There are many other tools also out there. Um, it includes all Shaw devices and many third-party device profiles. It has a database of uh, TV channels, uh, which are also country-specific. And you can work in the offline mode and easily bring all your networked devices online once they're connected uh, to your laptop. Um, we did a run through of uh, frequency coordination. So we'll run through some of the miscellaneous points from there. The first one was we add devices via the inventory tab, um, via the dialog box, uh, we can add show, we can add third-party devices, um, and if you hover over a frequency band name for tuning limits. Um, you can flash the inventory so that you know that the device is connected. Uh, you can use it in online and offline mode. Um, you can change various parameters like uh, the name, the colors, uh, you can do zones, you can do tags. Uh, you can select multiple uh, devices and you can auto enumerate them. Uh, you can change colors, you can change headers, zones, types, etc. Uh, when we head to the frequency coordination page, um, the purpose of this page is to basically calculate frequencies for your inventory. So you pull all the frequencies from your inventory into the frequency coordination page. Um, and with the click of a few buttons, you can have a whole bunch of fresh frequencies calculated and deployed to your inventory. Um, the frequency coordination page also has certain sections where you can watch the, you can have a look at the plot properties. Um, you can add scan data. You can see live scans. You can do sky live scans. You can import scan files. Um, um, you can zoom in, pan, you can um, move to various sections of the scan as well to just have a closer look at uh, what is happening. In the monitor tab, you can customize the view of the monitor tab um, as per different, uh, let's say, types of channels, uh, which makes browsing through the inventory very, um, uh, very easy. Um, And when you are in working in the offline mode, uh, you can build your inventory, you can set the properties ahead of time, you can plan around regular uh, regulatory TV channels, especially if you're in um, if you're out of India. Um, um, there are TV channels which are data based in the software for the US and for most of Europe. And uh, you can import a previously generated scan. So let's say you had an event at a venue uh, two weeks ago. You can save that file and you can import it today. 
uh, for your job that you might have today. Uh, we had a look at organizing the show file. We did channel names, device IDs. Uh, we used uh, color coding. We made uh, tags so that we can sort the inventory much easier. Um, we didn't necessarily go through the TV channel database last time. And the simple reason for that is India doesn't necessarily have at the moment a database where you can access various TV channels based on your PIN code. As you'll see from this slide, um, under the drop down menu that says United States, you can actually enter a PIN code. And on the right hand side, it will show you an entire list of the various TV stations, the call sign, the type of station, and the frequency range in which uh, the TV station operates. Um, and if you see the last column that says distance, it will actually show you the distance from that PIN code location. Um, it's very, very, very helpful when you are working in the United States or in most of Europe where their, their TV channels are, data, are cataloged. Um, today we'll have a look at uh, a few more functions. Uh, first is to merge an offline and online device. Now, considering that you we spoke about designing the show um, offline, and now you take it to an online device, the problem that occurs there is that you might have slightly different settings on your on your offline file as compared to the settings that are online. Uh, now there's a way to mitigate that. So we're going to have a look at uh, that next. We're going to see some scanning options. Um, we're going to <clears throat> deploy, we'll have a look at deploying and monitoring frequencies and generating a basic report. Now wireless workbench, like we saw the last time, will automatically discover and add a device that is online. You just need to connect your Cat5 cable and in most cases you're good to go. Um, added devices are remembered when they go offline and online again. So once the device is online and you've made some changes, supposing you have, a, um, once the network's back on, those devices will show exactly as are. But on a first time basis, if that happens, uh, you need to mitigate that by using the merge function. There are several ways to scan. Like we saw, you can scan from the um, you can scan from the um, from the receiver. You can scan from a spectrum manager. You can have a third-party device to scan, uh, and you can scan through the wireless workbench software as well. Um, one of the main things to be aware of is to understand the availability of spectrum. And this includes certain features called exclusions. Uh, it includes two uh, horizontal lines, which you see on the frequency plot. One is called the scan peak threshold. <clears throat> um, there is, um, uh, you can also manually assign uh, certain exclusion types. And there's a function called the timeline. Now, exclusions are basically what you do not want the software to take into consideration when it does its calculation. You're basically telling the software, do not put any frequencies in these areas. And these areas that you see at the moment highlighted uh, with those blue vertical bars, those are called, those are exclusions. They automatically detected from a scan. And as long as uh, any of those peaks go over the scan, um, the exclusion threshold, which is the lower red line, they will show up, they will automatically show up as uh, exclusions. You can also define them, you can also give them uh, names. Now, I'm sure you'll have noticed uh, the second horizontal line, which is colored in orange. Now that's called the scan peak threshold. Um, what you need to tell the software is if you have a peak that goes above the orange line, what exactly is it? Now, is it why this is very important is because it takes the information that you give it 
um, uh, to use that information in how it calculates uh, intermodulations to an extent. So you need to, there are various uh, ways in which you can categorize a frequency which is above the scan peak threshold. Uh, it also creates a frequency buffer between, you see the legs of the frequency, between where um, to minimize basically the risk of interference. Basically, in simple terms, just telling you how close you can put one of your frequencies to that scan peak. And there are various categories of scan peaks, and we'll go through that in a little bit. Now, an exclusion can be one of the following. It can be a generic device. Uh, it can be a wideband generic device. Um, it can be a generic device, but that does not cause intermodulation. So think of it this way. A generic device that causes intermodulation could be maybe an open microphone, uh, wireless microphone that's very, an open transmitter that's very close to your stage. The chances are that a uh, microphone could come in contact with one of your main performance microphones and could cause intermodulation. So that's how you will describe a generic device IMD, basically saying a generic device that causes intermodulation. The next is a generic device, but no intermodulation. Uh, think of this now as a TV station that might be you know, a couple of miles away from you. So there's no real possibility of that transmitter coming uh, in contact with your transmitters on your stage. Um, in this case, the software just considers that peak as a TV station, but there are no chances of it causing intermodulation. There are certain parameters which it will um, exclude when it does its calculation. Now, a generic exclusion. This could just be, um, you know, uh, various frequencies that you've done, uh, various frequencies that have popped up in your scan, and um, you basically don't know what they are. You know, at the end of the day, we are not, um, the software just tells us what is around. It's how we, uh, uh, how we interpret the data that the software collects. Uh, and can create these inclusions that actually lets the software then calculate the frequencies. Um, this timeline is a very, very useful feature. Basically, um, consider yourself, you know, the moment you finish doing a scan, you're ready to check your transmitter, You'll probably talk on the mic, you'll go from you know, various points on the stage, make sure it's not dropping, stuff like that. Um, where timeline comes into play is uh, it basically does that for you. So you can actually start a timeline recording and uh, it basically keeps check of various uh, parameters of the, of the transmitter. So as you'll see from this diagram, um, right at the top in purple, is in case you were using an Axion digital transmitter, uh, you'd actually off that frequency. When I say off that frequency, I mean quality of the chosen carrier frequency. Let's take 600 megahertz just as an example. The next one is you see a little triangle with a line and A and B, those are the antennas. So that's actually telling you if your antennas are actually connected. Uh, very, very useful tool. Um, you know, very often you might you know, and hook up a BNC cable to the antennas, but you don't really know if that antenna is actually connected. Um, this is one of the tools that will let you um, uh, know that. The next one is the signal strength. So signal strength on the A antenna and signal strength on the B antenna. As you can see, two lines. One is um, orange in color and the other is uh, yellow. So it's basically telling you how much signal is coming into each of those um, of those uh, antennas. The next is um, you can either talk on the mic or uh, some of the products have a tone generator on the transmitter. So you can turn on that transmitter and you know basically walk around the stage and uh, 
if there are any kinds of dropouts, um, it will kind of uh, let, let you know. Uh, next is battery life. And the last line at the bottom there is uh, what's known as show link. Now show link is um, um, uh, a system which comes with the Axin digital transmitters. It's compatible with the ADX version of Axin digital. And it basically allows you to have remote control over the transmitters. Uh, we'll get into Showlink uh, more when uh, we do a webinar on Axion Digital. Um, where timeline comes into real handy is um, um, you turn on timeline, maybe take a lead vocalist microphone out to the center of the stage, walk to the end of a ramp if there's one, walk to near the uh, LED wall, uh, and you can keep tracking the parameters of the transmitter. And in the case of Axion Digital, you can drop markers. As you see those white lines, you can drop markers from various points uh, from various points on the stage. Uh, let's talk now about spectrum optimization. Um, this includes a few features. One is inclusion groups. Next is the coordination order. And next is backup frequencies. Now, inclusion groups basically tell the software, please put frequencies only in this space. Uh, why is that important? Uh, well, for most practical purposes, you always want to have your in-ear monitor and your transmitter frequencies. So that means your wireless mics and your wireless in-ear monitor frequencies separated. Uh, ideally, when purchasing these products, they should always be in separate bands. Uh, and another, if it's unavoidable that the bands are overlapping, uh, then a best practice is to actually separate the devices as per their frequencies. So you see uh, a grayish, uh, two grayish vertical bands. Those are basically inclusion groups. So I'm telling the software that the first bunch of frequencies go into an inclusion group, which uh, consists of channel 13 and channel 14. And the second inclusion group, which could be for in-ear monitors, tells the software, you know, inclusion groups, all these frequencies go into channel 18 and channel 19. Now, you might think, why is this important? Um, now, consider that all these transmitters are turned on and someone in a neighboring stage does a scan. They, all these frequencies, now channel 13, 14, and channel uh, 18 and 19, show up to the person doing the scan on some other stage or some other venue. They will show up as, almost show up as a TV channel. Uh, which is what you, uh, someone else scanning and the software to tell that person, you know, there are a lot of frequencies in this very small space. Uh, you know, it's a bad idea to put anything there. Um, so let's, let's put frequencies elsewhere. That's where inclusion groups, uh, play a very important, a, a very important part. So like I mentioned, first you organize the frequency coordination. Uh, high and low power devices and you set different compatibility levels to the same device model. What is that? We will discuss a few slides. How to create inclusion groups? Firstly, you will do that from the frequency coordination page. There's a spectrums tab um, <clears throat> and you will in that you will open the inclusions window. Enable an inclusions list, create an inclusion group, and view the inclusion in the coordination plot. Now, I'm going through this a little quick because I'm actually going to get back to the software after we complete this presentation, and uh, we will actually go through all those steps to create uh, inclusion groups. So as you see in this slide, uh, in box number three, that's where you will start placing your uh, under list, I'll probably call it maybe the show that I have today, show XYZ. Uh, my groups could be, like it's mentioned, they're more robust, which we'll get into also, or it could simply be in your monitors or, um, or um, uh, vocal mics. 
and then next to that i can create a range where it tells me where it, uh, not it tells me where i tell the software put all your uh, vocal mics in this range and put all your in your monitors in this range and as you see below in box number four is where you get that vertical um, gray line <clears throat> that vertical gray line uh, which denotes an inclusion group uh, frequency coordination order is a very important page and it's quite often overlooked and you'll notice that um, for any of you playing with the software at home that if you add inventory to your inventory tab and then you pull all that equipment into the frequency coordination tab you'll notice that the order is different uh, now there is there is a very significant reason why it is different and that's because all the devices which are at the top are devices which the software finds harder to get frequencies for so for example if you put if you have an inventory with axiom digital ulxd psm 1000 you pull that into frequency coordination now suddenly you should see psm 1000 up first ulxd after that and axiom digital third uh, and that's simply the software taking its time to find the more difficult frequencies first and then find the frequencies that are easier uh, a little later so uh, like we have here default coordination order is de determined by the uh, by least to most agile system yeah Oh, that's clear. Um, if you go to the preferences tab under coordination and coordination order, you can actually see the entire order of all devices. And now this is, again, you have to remember that this is all shore devices and all third party devices as well. So every single device that uh, the software can handle will be in that list in the order of what's the easiest to what's the most tough to find frequencies for. Lastly, we come to backup channels. Now, in um, it's all fair to say that, yes, we've done our frequency coordination and uh, we've deployed frequencies. And at the time of deploying them, those frequencies were rock solid. But hey, you know, problems happen. Um, suddenly, before the show, now you have like, you know, 50 press people walk in with various devices of various frequencies, and now you have a problem. Um, or if you're in a government um, event kind of thing, yeah, you have a problem. Um, the way to mitigate that is to have backup channels. So there are three ways to find the backup channels. First is you can automatically calculate backup frequencies. You can manually request backup frequencies. And you can use primary frequencies and then move them to a backup tab. So three ways to do it. Uh, Prefer uh, preferentially for me, I either use automatic or I manually request backup frequencies. Automatic basically creates um, hundreds of frequencies in a matter of a couple of seconds. Uh, I prefer to just make my frequencies based on exactly how many backups I think I would require. As a rule of thumb, uh, and this is personally for me, uh, if I've got four devices, I'll have at least two backup frequencies. If I've got eight, I'll have at least four backup frequencies and so on. So at least half the number of backup frequencies as uh, devices. Even that's a little excessive, uh, but it's better, in my opinion, to be safe than to be sorry. Um, let's talk now about uh, getting into stadiums and arenas and what the problems um, that you can encounter in these kinds of venues. The first one is a very high channel count of transmitters and in-ear monitors. Uh, it's very, very common. And if you look at this picture, you'll think, oh yeah, but it looks like a, a football match, you know, it shouldn't be such a big deal. Uh, it is a very big deal because you have a load of wireless mics you have a load of IFB um, feeds for the broadcasters. You'll have a lot of intercoms. For a typical event like this, you're looking at uh, channels in the range of 200, 250 channels, maybe even more. Yeah, you, you don't you don't assume that by looking at the picture, but and a typical event, sporting event like this would be at least 200 odd, odd uh, channels of uh, wireless. Um, a very important thing in these venues is 
you have a spotting game and then you will have a certain section where you'll have a VIP singer or a VIP artist. Now, how do you make sure that the VIP talent's frequencies are very, very safe? Yeah. Um, and I think the most important in all this is long range operation. Uh, this kind of a sporting ground would, in my opinion, be around, uh, around 800 to 1,000 feet front to back. Uh, that's a lot of distance to cover. Uh, it takes special planning as to where the antennas go, what kind of frequencies you choose, what power of transmitters, etc. Um, we look after that at compatibility parameters. And uh, these basically give you three things. It's uh, One is a compatibility level, uh, equipment profiles, and you can compare frequency calculators. Compatibility levels are of three types. Uh, the standard mode, uh, robust, and more frequencies. And if you look at the graph, it's quite easy to understand that uh, uh, robust gives you far less channels, but it also gives you the most robust channels in terms of uh, interference. Standard is the regular mode of uh, operation and gives you default channel spacing. spacing. More frequencies, uh, basically, yes, they give you much more frequencies, but then you also increase the chance of interference. So these three modes are very important to be aware of. You might be in a situation where you cannot find enough frequencies, and you might then change the compatibility level to more frequencies, but you have to remember that that also increases the chance of interference. Um, equipment profiles um, basically tell the software certain things. And you can now set up, uh, not now, you could always set up equipment profiles. All show devices will come with their equipment profile. All third party devices will also come with their own equipment profiles. But you can also make um, a custom equipment profiles in case um, uh, the equipment that you're looking for is not in the inventory list. So spacing parameters a wireless system requires for compatibility. The first one varies by system design, yes, based on your application that is going to change. Uh, uh, there are many, many, many equipment profiles in wireless workbench. Uh, every model of equipment, every model slash band of equipment has a slightly different equip equipment profile, and this is all in the uh, in the list. Uh, or you can create your own uh, or modify an existing uh, profile. And just one point to remember is that more spacing generally equals maximum operating distance and performance stability. Uh, think about that for a second. The more your frequencies are spaced, basically give you maximum operating distance. And that results in your system overall being far more stable. These are the three pages you will see when you go to the equipment profile parameters. The first one is the actual profile details. And then you'll see, for example, manufacturer, model, band, transmitting power, device type. Uh, the second page is uh, tuning. Basically, as per the first page, uh, this is uh, Axiom Digital uh, dual device uh, at the J8 frequency, I believe. And uh, J8 frequency band, and uh, and uh, uh, under tuning, you actually see what that frequency range is. And the last window, uh, you see filtering and intermods. So these parameters now are all for all show devices will already be there for you. Uh, I would highly recommend not changing any of these parameters unless you are absolutely, absolutely sure of what you are doing. For most cases, you do not need to get into this page and change anything here. Just remember that any changes here, um, then change how the software will actually do its calculation. So this is a very, very critical uh, page. Um, 
this is just a, a broader look at each of these three um, at each of these three pages. So here, manufacturer show model uh, A8 band transmitter power. Um, <clears throat> you can also rename these profiles. So say, for example, if there's a device from a third party that I don't see in this list, a similar device, may device, I can edit that profile. Uh, if I have the manual, uh, you know, the actual spec sheet of the device I'm looking for, I can create a custom profile. Uh, that's basically what this page or the the last three pages uh, allow you to do. <clears throat> Excuse me. Global event arenas. Think about a festival. Think about a very large uh, corporate event that have multiple breakout rooms. Um, and there are three features which uh, are very important uh, over here. Number one is, number two is zones, and third is timeline. We spoke about, we discuss HD mode and zones now. Um, in very brief, HD mode basically puts um, the show Axiom Digital and the ULXD in a mode where it can um, uh, many cases of Axiom Digital for India, it is 63 frequencies in an 8 megahertz TV channel. That means in each of those little TV stations that we saw, 21, 22, 23, 24, you can have six up to 63 transmit. The drawback is that um, transmitter power at 2 milliwatt. Uh, why is that important? Because uh, transmitter power and intermodulation are directly uh, related. The higher the transmitter power, the higher the amount of uh, intermodulation and uh, intermodulation strength. So when you get into HD mode, yes, you have access to uh, channels, but uh, um, at your milliwatt, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because all these transmitters are used in a very small space and you can still get a good 100 odd a little more uh, feet of um, which for a small event is uh, very very sufficient <clears throat> the next one is zones <clears throat> excuse me um, now consider this slide of uh, you know typical um, a typical uh, festival scenario. <clears throat> so this is a typical festival scenario. This is the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Um, just to give you some uh, specifications about this festival, each of those red dots is actually a festival stage. Yeah. Um, as per this festival, um, <clears throat> There were 317 venues, 317. There were 55,000 performances, and the show went on for 25 days. Now, when we talk about large-scale RF deployment, this is what we're talking about. It's pretty much like an entire festival, an entire city being part of a festival. <clears throat> Next, let's get into zones. Uh, <clears throat> Zones are very interesting. It basically um, gives you the interaction between, think of it as an interaction between two venues. Um, and there could be um, three scenarios. Um, if you look at the slide, you see all the, um, uh, all the blue boxes uh, uh, mean channel to channel spacing. All the purple boxes mean intermodulation products. Now, let's break this down. Consider stage A and stage B. They are separated by um, what, 400, 500 feet. Okay, typical concert uh, festival scenario. In that case, care of is channel to channel spacing. That is everything in the blue box. We're not considered much. We don't consider much intermodulation spacing because there's no uh, chance of the equipment from one venue going over to the other venue and interacting with the other venue. So 
typical situation like this is where you'll um, click everything in the blue box and only if the stages overlap think of it as two stages that are uh, sharing the same pa system now in a situation like that yes there is definitely a chance that intermodulation uh, could happen because you'll have equipment from either stage uh, um, you know either making its way over to the other accidentally but it's something that you need to uh, take uh, consider so in that case so think of maybe stage um, um, let's see stage uh, four and five bullhead city and stage true metal if these two stages were absolutely side by side uh, sharing the same pa then i would want um, the software to uh, take into account intermodulation spacing as well <clears throat> Yeah, and this is exactly what I mentioned to you in the <clears throat> in the previous slide. And <clears throat> few consider um, sorry considerations when creating zones should be like I mentioned first the physical distance, the RF landscape basically what your scan uh, looks like, um, the RF output power of your transmitters uh, and specifically more importantly in your monitors because transmitters <clears throat> for mics generally don't uh, uh, especially the newer newer digital microphones uh, don't transmit um, uh, at very high powers whereas in your monitors uh, you can for example psm thousands can still go up to 100 milliwatts so you need to be careful of that is a big consideration uh, the other main consideration is the antennas in an antenna placement. The webinar, we'll go over very detailed uh, descriptions of antennas and why this is important. Just to give you a gist, in, when you create zones, um, you have to be very careful about antenna overlapping. Um, uh, just keep that in mind and we'll address the same uh, when we get into the next webinar about antennas. Um, to switch to uh, wireless workbench and there we are. So, Ali, this is Devraj. I created a base. Hey, Devraj. Just wanted to remind the audience that uh, we do have the Q&A window. Uh, so if you have any questions, guys, uh, please do uh, write to us on the Q&A page. You'll see on the right hand side of the tool. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Raj. So guys, uh, we'll get into software and then we'll get into a Q&A post that. So uh, as you can see, I have uh, the same two ULXD that I had the last time, but I've in, uh, brought in some Axion Digital and I've brought in some PSM 1000. Now, let me just go set up all this equipment. Um, you'll first see um, two colors, green and blue. And I've separated these uh, equipment based on two zones. First is a rock and roll stage and second is an EDM stage. And I'm taking into consideration that uh, you know these are reasonably close to each other okay that's the first and second is i've made some inclusion groups now all my axion digital inventory is g56 all my um, uh, ulxd is g51 and my psm 1000 are j8e now these happen to be also the bands for uh, that we use quite commonly in india and it also happens that they overlap to a certain degree so my first consideration will be to make these inclusion groups based on where i want to put the frequencies so this page we went over last time i'm not going to spend too much time here i'm going to go straight to frequency coordination um the first thing is under tools if you go to zone management these are the zones that i've created rock stage and edm stage and i've configured them specifically these two edm stage and rock stage um, to basically uh, denote that yes they are very close to each other and intermodulation is possible 
Okay, this is just for purpose of this demonstration. Um, I've then also made a bunch of inclusion groups. Uh, I'm going to open up this scan file that I have here, considering that this is a live scan. It's the same file that we used the last time. Um, now, when I see this page, um, I have equipment across all this area. But now I need to figure out how I'm going to separate my equipment. Um, the first thing is, um, let's say I want to put the Axin Digital stuff somewhere down here. Let's put the ULXD somewhere here because we have space. And this is all, um, if you go to the, um, the, the specification page of these products and the band, you can actually see that those frequencies fall in, in, this, in this area. And I'm going to push the PSM 1000 somewhere out, you know, a little above the six, uh, 600s. Um, um, I've created those inclusion groups under, so if you go to the Spectrum tab and down here, you will see under inclusion list, I've made one already. The so wireless workbench advanced and I've called one PSM 1000, I've called one Axiom Digital, I've called one ULXD. And I've told the software PSM, please put into channel 38, Axient in 26, and ULXD in 22. And basically what I've done is at the inventory page itself, I have assigned the inclusion groups. So I've done all this because then when I import everything into my inventory, everything comes already assigned comes assigned to the inclusion groups, it comes assigned also to the zones. And just correlate what's written here to the inventory tab, you'll see uh, four Axion Digital, two ULXD, that's six devices, and four PSM 1000. So that's 10 devices in the rock stage, and the balance eight devices in the EDM stage. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna talk really quick about the these two threshold peak thresholds. First is the exclusion threshold, and this one is the scan peak threshold. Now, why this is important is uh, I can actually characterize this scan peak uh, to be any one of these devices. So if I feel that it's a valid transmitter in my area and I don't want it, I don't want my, my equipment anywhere close to it, I will select the IMD version. If it is a generic device, could be a TV station, I will select no IMD. Okay. Um, another quick way to do exclusions is also to just select the TV channel. And if you right click, you get exclude channel 37. And then you see this nice red bar here. Okay, but we won't do that right now because the software will do it. Anyway, at the moment we've pulled in all our inventory. Let's calculate. Okay, so as you can see, my two ULXDs are now over here. My Axion Digital, all 10 of them are here. Uh, and my PSM 1000 are all here, completely separated from anything else. So the benefit of that is even my PSM 1000s are nowhere close to this, whatever this transmitter is here. And similarly, staying away from all this transmitter activity over here. So it's, it's really that simple and it's just a matter of how you want to deploy your equipment and uh, like, you know, seeing something like this is uh, for me as like a, if I was doing RF and I saw this kind of a, a plot, I'd be, I'd be quite happy with this. Um, uh, as opposed to, you know, kind of all over the place. So this was a quick and dirty you know, demonstration of all the slides that we went through um, earlier. Um, we could open up the, um, I'll just show you timeline really quick. Um, but timeline also, we will go into a lot of detail when we touch on antennas. So I'm gonna select, uh, let's see, D, uh,
Okay, so you see the ULXD is timeline. Let's select ULXD and we can just hit record. And now if I grab the transmitter, It seems like uh, we have some internet issues at Fali's end. I'll just give it a minute to, for him to turn back on. Uh, just to remind uh, to the attendees here, uh, I do see some questions coming in. Uh, so you know, maybe use this time to uh, go to the Q&A window if you have any questions regarding the content that Fali shared so far. Hey Devraj, this is Chico. Uh, since we're having some challenges, some technical difficulties with uh, Fully, uh, Fully's connect, uh, connection, uh, maybe we could uh, run the poll at the, at the moment and review yep, some of the questions. Right okay, great. Yeah, so while, while um, Devraj puts the poll together, I'm just gonna uh, read some of the questions and provide some answers. Uh, the first question is from uh, Kandakar. He says, can we see this webinar later? So all our, all our webinars are being recorded and we intend to host them on our official YouTube channel. Uh, it's gonna take a couple of days for the marketing team to uh, process this and have this up. But once it is ready, it'll be up to uh, share with you and you can watch this again. Uh, the next question from Arshad is, when is the next webinar? Uh, so we actually have uh, two different kind of webinars that are currently happening. Uh, we have some global webinars taking place. These are being hosted by our colleagues in the headquarters in the US. Uh, obviously not from our office, but uh, from their respective homes, uh, like how we're doing today. And then we also have our web webinars here in India that we are conduct conducting for the audience in India. And this, this is being done by the Shore India team. Uh, so we have uh, two types of webinars that are happening. Uh, we have a group of systems webinars, which are happening at 3 p.m. Uh, we just had one today, uh, which is what Devaraj is conducting. These are all in Hindi, and these are focusing on our systems products. And then we have a seven o'clock uh, webinar, which are focusing more on the uh, pro vertical and MCA vertical, and this is what Folly is conducting. Uh, we are putting out information about these webinars on Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram. Um, we also uh, have an email, uh, india at shore.com. You can email us if you have any more questions. That. Um, the next question is from Arshad is again. He asks, can we get a certificate for this webinar? So these webinars are not, um, you know, for to gain certification. These are just to, uh, you know, for learning purposes. However, we do have our Short Audio Institute uh, platform. It's a learning platform where we do provide certification, um, and this is uh, available on the 
link, which is https colon forward slash forward slash shore, S-H-U-R-E, S-A dash S-H-U-R-E dot talent LMS dot com. Devraj, thanks for putting uh, that on the screen. Yeah, so there you can see it on the screen. That's the uh, the website you can go to. You can register for free and take up any of the courses, the modules you wish. Uh, the great thing is that we've recently um, started a uh, game, game, gamification, so you can get points and badges, and you can compete with your friends and who's got the highest points. Good luck with that. All right, next question um, from Rahul. Uh, is it is it Antenna play a major role, key source for the Axiom Digital Rack. Could you discuss more about antenna placement? Yes, Rose. So, uh, you know, the simple answer to that is yes. Uh, oh, do we have Fali back on? Yes, I think. Uh, yeah, it was strange. My mic was muted for some reason. Oh, okay. We thought you, we lost yeah, you. So, I'm back. Uh, um, so, yeah, Axiom Digital. Axiom Digital question. Yeah, Dev, would you want to take over? Uh, yeah, cool. Uh, so, uh, Chico, would you like to continue with that question and then we proceed, or let Fali complete the session? Yeah, yeah let's finish uh, that one. So, yeah, let's uh, let 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 Fali answer the question. It so, is... okay. go, ahead. go ahead. Cool. So, um, uh, it see it's it's not about just the accent digital it kind of it's important for um, any wireless system uh, the 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 foundation of any wireless system to work properly is the um, uh, cables need to be of good quality and you need to have a good frequency coordination done if you have these three things um, you won't have a problem with uh, an, a wireless system. But yes, antenna position is very, very, very important. Let's go to the next question. Okay, uh, the next question is from Josh Joshua. He asks, if you have 200 plus channels to coordinate, like in stadiums and arenas, would you use high density mode if possible? Of course, most definitely, most definitely. But you need to keep in mind that in high density mode, uh, your transmitter power is lower. So your range is lower. So uh, I, I would probably use it maybe for that's in the center of the arena and if my hands could probably use it for that um but it is you can use high density mode the the better usage would probably be for theater for broadway for uh, very large corporate deployments in a very small space uh, so hd mode um, yeah, but I don't see why not in a stadium, but you need to take into account that your range would be uh, much lower because of the lower power. Cool, let's check the next question. Question is from Nandeshwar. He asks, can we connect a third party microphone of frequency 543.26 megahertz here to short antenna system? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, I understood two things from that question. Number one, if you have a, a secondary, uh, uh, sometimes yes, in some of the older, older analog uh, wireless systems, uh, it can be done. Um, it's much you can't do it these days uh, with the digital technology. It's the uh, devices are not compatible, but in the very old days. Um, it's most certainly possible. And it's most certainly a, a problem of interference where you would have another device that would be probably on the same frequency as your main device and get it to. Yep, next question. 
All right. Uh, XYZ asks, how will the software get to know if the mics are being used with splitters or without splitters? Um, that's a good question. Um, and the point is that the software doesn't need to know if your mics are used with splitters or no splitters. Uh, creation of that RF system needs to be to buy you on pen and paper. Because you need to know how much loss, where, length of cables, how much loss in the cable, how much loss over the air. Um, uh, those are very important and those you need to calculate yourself. But the software basically just scans and it's not, cons it's only consider concerned with what the receiving antennas see. It's not concerned with uh, how your deployment is uh, done. I hope that, that, that explanation. Cool, what else do we have? Okay, so next question is, uh, can we deploy frequency in third-party devices through software? No, my friend, you cannot do that. You can calculate the frequencies, but then you create a um, 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 a frequency chart and you give that to your assistant and let him he has to go and manually enter the frequencies this is for third party devices and that's where the strength actually of wireless workbench comes in because you can do the calculation and the deployment for all sure devices that's where it basically cuts your time down quite drastically when you have multiple uh, devices cool next okay. question uh, next is uh, I think you can make this quick. What is the difference between a dome antenna and a spiral antenna? Oh, we're covering all antennas in the next uh, webinar, and we'll be covering domes, the, as you put it, spiral, uh, uh, paddles, uh, all of those will be covered in the next uh, webinar, which is coming up on Friday, I believe, at 7 p.m. Let's go to the next. Yep. Uh, next is... Why do we get a lot of RF issues when we have huge LED wall screens? I think this is also a topic to be covered uh, on Friday because yeah, we'll RF. cover it there. Yeah, yeah. But basically, the thing is that LED walls also emit RF and wideband RF, so uh, it happens. Consoles, LED, any electronic equipment, lights, all emit RF. Um, hmm. It's possible. Okay. So uh, we have time for three more questions that I see on the screen. Uh, one is, uh, can you talk about uh, importance of passive splitters while using multiple antenna positions since we have very wide stage along with the lengthy stage ramps? I'm talking about the festival stages. I have come across splitters from RF venues and mini circuits. Right. Um, see, that there's no harm in using a passive splitter. What you need to bear in mind is that there is a 3 dB insertion loss. Um, so you have to factor that into your calculation and uh, um, as a, as a th rule of thumb, you, the entire RF system coming back to each antenna, you do not want to lose in the best case scenario more than 3 dB um, and the worst case, worst case scenario more than 5 dB, which means then you need to add inline amplifiers and amplification to make that up. It's definitely usable, but it has to be factored into your calculation, no question. Or the other thing is then you use like the Axiom Digital in quadversity mode. So then you can have actually four antennas at four different positions without uh, the need for any splitter. Cool. What else do we have? Okay. <clears throat> Next one is, uh, I think it's a bit of a subjective one. Uh, how to boost uh, RF signal and in which circumstances we need that? How to boost RF signal? Um, see, the, the thing is that although you may consider boosting to be a good thing, it in many cases can be the worst thing that you can do. It's like, uh, and the, the problem with that is you can end up distorting uh, the front end filter of the receiver by boosting too much power in the receive antenna. Uh, it's something you need to be careful of, and it is also something that I am covering in the antennas webinar that we have that we have uh, coming up on Friday. So you can stay tuned for that. 
Cool. So the last one is again regarding antenna, uh, which I'm very sure will be covered in Friday. The question is about uh, which antenna is good for uh, live use. All antennas are good for live use. It just depends on uh, depends on a lot of factors. How big the stage is, how big the venue is, how far the musicians from your antenna is. So you can pretty much use any antenna in a live scenario. It just depends on the situation. Uh, my personal favorites are circularly polarized antennas. Uh, they work the best, but again, they are restricted to slightly larger stages. But we'll cover that on, on Friday as well. Excellent. So I think that's all we had in the Q&A section as of now. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just, since we have a minute, I'm just uh, scanning through some of the chats that the attendees had put. Uh, mm -hmm. I think... Mm -hmm. uh, I think those have been responded by Chico. Uh, so guys, uh, for people who are looking to contact us over email, uh, our email address is india at .com, So you can write to us uh, on that. And uh, you know, basically, we would be able to uh, get the queries and uh, respond to you there. So this is the address, uh, as I mentioned, india at .com. Awesome. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care, and we'll see you soon. Thank you, guys. Bye.